This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Uh, originally, Joe gave me this very long titled topic that you can see in the, in the program, and it's, what is it? It's patients with carotid stenosis and ipsilateral silent infarcts are not really asymptomatic. When I went to put that on my lead slide, I had, hardly had any room for my name. <clears throat> and since a lot of people are probably not used to seeing me in a tie, I decided it, just to be sure my name got up there, I shortened the title to asymptomatic carotid stenosis, but in fact expanded the topic uh, to some degree to, to review asymptomatic carotid disease and, and see where are we with this, uh, this subject. Again, as has already been pointed out, uh, there's a significant number of carotid procedures done every year, either endarterectomy or stenting, uh, over 100,000 annually in the U.S., uh, and <clears throat> it's seen that other than varicose vein procedures and dialysis procedures. This is typically one of the top CPT codes uh, listed by vascular surgeons on an annual basis. But again, as noted by Joe, a majority of these procedures are done for asymptomatic stenoses. Uh, that steno that uh, symptomatic patients make up only a small percentage of those that we treat. The justification for treating asymptomatic disease is for the most part based on two trials. The asymptomatic carotid atherosclerosis study and the asymptomatic carotid surgery trial. In these trials, uh, particularly the ACAS trial we'll focus on here, which Joe again mentioned, there was a, a randomization to either medical therapy, which was aspirin, or carotid endarterectomy. And it was seen in, that in patients with uh, greater than 60% uh, internal carotid artery stenosis, there was a reduction of event from 11.8% uh, to 6.4%. Uh, and this uh, really has become the basis for our indication to treat asymptomatic carotid stenosis. Subsequently, most centers and, and trials have increased the threshold, as Dr. Bandick was talking about, to perhaps up to 80% uh, before they would treat. And yet still, with the, an 80% stenosis, there's still a question, are we benefiting patients uh, by treating them in it with asymptomatic disease? So the challenge, really, of treatment of asymptomatic disease is uh, one that's uh, there for us. Uh, because first of all, does stenosis really equate to stroke risk? If we're talking about embolizing lesions, uh, what is really a 70% lesion? Why is that more severe than an 80%, or less severe than an 80% lesion? Uh, really, it's, it's more so it's just a marker of a, of a bigger, bulkier plaque. And what about medical management? Many neurologists will now point out that the treatment of aspirin alone is really antiquated and that modern medical management really, really, really uh, gives uh, so many more options. And, and realistically, in today's uh, venue, the Medical management of asymptomatic carotid disease includes not only antiplatelet therapy, but high-dose statin agents, uh, antihypertensive, uh, tight control of blood pressure, tight control of blood sugars, lifestyle changes, including dietary changes, and exercise. And what if we applied all of these things to the uh, ACAS trial? Would the results have been different? But having said that, we recognize that only 15% of strokes are preceded by TIAs. If we identify patients who have significant carotid stenosis but stop operating on them, we'll miss treating a lot of patients who have strokes. And so that we'll, we'll miss our opportunity to prevent a significant number of strokes from occurring. Again, if we look at medical therapy, and again, I think Joe pointed this out in his talk, more recent studies using a much more aggressive medical uh, therapy regimen, both from the UK and Canada, have demonstrated that there's a two-year ipsilateral stroke risk uh, 
of less than 1%. And again, in, in looking at the data from the Crest trial, which, which has already been pointed out, is probably as good a data as seen in any trial, the 30-day risk of stroke and death, and I'm leaving out MI, uh, was 1.4% for CEA and 2.5% and for CAS. So that, again, the question comes up, are we benefiting patients with asymptomatic carotid disease by subjecting them to the risk of these procedures? Now, in addition, there's the question of survival, and, and again, we've, we've already talked about this today, that if patients don't survive that long, then they're not really going to get the benefit of the, uh, of the procedure. A recent study from the New England Vascular Study Group uh, looked at this topic specifically, and they found that the, there was a significant reduction in the benefit to patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis if they were treated and yet survived less than five years. And they identified factors that they found would indicate to them that these patients were not gonna last five years and they were specifically age greater than 80, dialysis, insulin-dependent diabetes, and severe contralateral stenosis. Yet, this is interesting, but if patients came into your clinic with a reasonably appearing 80-year-old individual who was a diabetic, would you deny that patient with a 90% carotid stenosis intervention? And I think all of us would say no. So again, we have a lot of interesting information, uh, but what do we really want to do with that? What I have found in, in reviewing this subject, subject that Joe has assigned me is that perhaps there's a way of identifying patients who are high-risk asymptomatic who have high risk asymptomatic carotid stenosis. And if we identify those patients and, and approach them either with surgery or stenting, uh, we'll give, grant them a lot of benefit and perhaps treat medically those who are low risk. And what are the ways that we can use to identify high risk patients? Well, one way is detection of microemboli on transcranial Doppler. A second way is to really evaluate the plaque morphology, again, as Joe was talking about on ultrasound, if the, if the plaques are hypoechoic or if they're ulcerated, lipophilic, or have necrotic centers, probably these are at high risk for embolization. And a third way is to evaluate plaque morphology assessments by specific protocols on MRI. The most studied uh, one of these uh, uh, techniques is uh, using transcranial Doppler. In the asymptomatic carotid emboli study, or ACEs, tri ACEs trial, or ACEs study, uh, did just that. They asked the question of whether detection of asymptomatic embolic signals from transcranial Doppler could predict stroke risk. And really, if you think about it, is this really an asymptomatic lesion? If you do a transcranial Doppler and you identify that emboli, emboli are occurring, what is the difference between that and someone who's had an event from an embolic plaque. Basically, both of those plaques are embolizing, and perhaps we're just talking about an asymptomatic plaque that we're not seeing uh, a clinical event from, or as Joe refers to as a silent infarct. The question brought out through the study was whether this would stratify patients as to being more likely to benefit from treatment. So they used the transcranial Doppler. It's a non-invasive technique that detects circulating emboli that appear as short duration, high intensity signals. This was an international study, multi-center. They included patients with greater than 70% carotid stenosis by ultrasound, but had been asymptomatic for two years. They performed two one-hour transcranial Doppler recordings separated by one week uh, on the ipsilateral middle cerebral artery. They repeated the transcranial Doppler study at six, 12, and 18 months. And I'm not, I'm not going to put up all the data, but their primary endpoint was ipsilateral TIA and stroke. The secondary endpoint was ipsilateral stroke, any stroke, any, or any stroke in death. And what they found was that there was an absolute annual risk of stroke or TIA of seven point, of greater than 7% in patients with signals and 3% in patients without signals. So, they, so that they found a significant risk of a patient to have an event if on their initial two studies, uh, emboli occurred. They also found that if patients did not have emboli in their initial 
evaluation. But at any time later in these studies, at six, eight, 12, or 18 months, were found to have emboli. These patients were now at risk to have a new event and greater than the, than the patients without emboli. So certainly this does seem to be, have an ability to stratify patients uh, who are asymptomatic for uh, being high risk and who would be held, uh, benefited by the procedure. Yet uh, very few people do actually do this procedure even though it's, it's available at many non-invasive labs. So again, getting back to silent infarcts, what are silent infarcts? Well, there are CT or MRI abnormalities in patients who have not had symptoms. We know that if we look at CT scans or MRIs, embolic lesions tend to be non-lacunar in appearance. Carotid plaques associated with non-lacunar silent infarcts tend to be hypoechoic. So the question is, is this a marker for a plaque that will embolize and cause a silent infarct? Should one do a CT scan if you see a patient with a hypoechoic plaque on your, on your routine ultrasound? And that if you did that, would you be more uh, aggressive with treatment of these patients who are asymptomatic? And again, uh, as, as Chris has just talked about, what about cognitive function? This seems to be a new topic that, that people are talking about in terms of carotid disease. Uh, a recent study in the neurologic literature uh, from Croatia uh, found a significant cognitive decline in patients with asymptomatic carotid stenosis. They found lower scores on, on cognitive testing. They performed the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, or the MOCA test, and they examined 150 right-handed patients with internal carotid artery stenosis of greater than 70%. Interestingly, they found that in carotid stenosis on the left side, in the testing, language and memory were uh, reduced and in carotid, right-sided carotid stenosis, it was a visual or spatial skills. In a similar time frame from Japan, showed significant improvement in cognitive testing uh, three months after carotid end arterectomy in a small number of patients, 15. Uh, but there was definitely a suggestion that carotid end arterectomy did improve their cognitive function. So putting all that, that all together, I, I've tried to come up with a sort of a, a guideline or where I think one could stand in, in using some of this information. And when I talked to Dennis, he had said that he was going to uh, give us an idea of what to do with ultrasound. And I thought I'd give a, a further sort of guidelines on where I think this stands with treatment of asymptomatic disease. In terms of, of what to, treatment to, to apply to this, obviously we've talked about carotid endarterectomy versus stenting. In, in our practice, carotid endarterectomy is done for all normal risk patients. We do not, we, I think that there's pretty unanimity that carotid endarterectomy is less of a stroke risk than stenting. And so for all patients who are normal risk, we'll offer carotid endarterectomy. And any patient who is essentially contraindicated for stenting, so the patients who have significant calcification of the arch or the origin vessels, severe tortuosity of the internal carotid, circumferential calcification of the lesion, or age greater than 80, these patients should be uh, approached with uh, open surgery. Carotid stenting can be reserved for patients with adverse neck anatomy, such as radical neck dissection, radiation therapy, reoperative lesions, tracheostomy, surgically inaccessible lesions, or patients with severe cardiac comorbidities. So having accepted that, I think that there's, there's no question that patients with significant carotid stenosis, however you evaluate them by ultrasound or other imaging, uh, but who are symptomatic, merit treatment. In terms of asymptomatic carotid stenosis, I think that the first thing is to get them on aggressive lifestyle and risk factor modification. Consider carotid endarterectomy or stenting for any patient with a severe carotid stenosis so that the case that Dr. Bandick showed with a, a critical ultrasound finding, those patients should be treated. I, I think that, that that's convincing. In patients with bilateral severe disease, again, they probably fall into the category that, that those should also undergo treatment. But what about patients who are classified as severe by ultrasound but are in the 70 to 90 percent range? Consider transcranial Doppler or CT MRI to stratify them to some degree uh, to decide if these are patients who are at high risk and or really having silent events and should be treated aggressively like, like uh, symptomatic lesions. And in terms of cognitive function, 
if a patient presents with new cognitive disabilities, uh, there's a suggestion that treatment with endarterectomy is indicated. Again, given that there is a fair number of hits after uh, carotid stenting, I think that if you're treating patients for cognitive function disabilities, <clears throat> endarterectomy is the treatment of choice. Thank you.